This is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we have an opportunity to gather together as the people of God and behold our God as a congregation, as a church. He took away our sin and gave us his righteousness and he rose from the dead, proving victory. And that's how he showed his grace to us. To be made right with him, to receive forgiveness of sins is possible when you believe and you confess him as Lord. And that means that you say, God, I'm tired of living with me at the center and I want you to be my Lord and I want to turn from my sin and I want to trust in you and I want to submit my life to your law and submit my life to your word. And that is what it means to be a Christian. You have the same power in your life to share the gospel that Jesus Christ had in his life. You've got infinite power. You just don't see it. You don't believe it. Believe it. Believe Jesus gave you a gift to preach the gospel. The power that Jesus had is the power that we have when we believe and Jesus used the power to preach and be a witness and we are to use the power and preach and be a witness as well. Well, good morning. Thank you. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Psalm 2, the book of Psalms, chapter 2. It's a real delight to have the kids help the adults lead us in worship this morning. All four of my kids were up here on stage, and for them to be able to do that represents a significant investment in them by so many of you in our church and the leaders that serve with them. So I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for a church that values that as well. Amen. We're looking at Psalm chapter 2 this morning. I'm going to go ahead and read the whole psalm and then ask for the Lord's help in prayer. Let me go ahead and read this. This is the word of the Lord. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance. And the very ends of the earth is your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son that he not become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Let's pray. And dear God, you have a message from us from this text this morning. You have a word you want to speak to your people. The words of the psalm are a heavy word, a weighty message, a serious message you want to communicate this morning. But I pray, God, that as your people hears this word, we would rejoice in it in the same way that the early church, when they quoted this psalm in the midst of persecution, in the midst of troubling times, they quoted it to find help and encouragement and hope. I pray, Father, that your people would find help and hope an encouragement this morning from these words because we look to Jesus, the one who rescued us. We thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ. May he be lifted up this morning. It's in Christ that we pray. Amen. You know, it wasn't that long ago that my wife, Tina, and I, we actually enjoyed going to bed most nights and watching the news before we went to sleep. We wanted to follow with interest what was going on. We wanted to be informed what was happening in the world. But 
the reality is, to be honest, I can, can't even really watch the news anymore. It either makes me mad, makes me want to cry, or I just shake my head in utter disbelief. Just when we think things can't get any worse, somehow they always do. It's just unbelievable. I mean, our, our country is literally tearing itself apart over all kinds of issues like coronavirus protocols and vaccine mandates and race riots and immigration crises and climate change policies and mail-in ballots and Supreme Court appointments and massive spending bills. And the list goes on and on and on. Some of you hear, some of you hear me listing those things right now. <laughs> maybe, maybe you feel like I do when I watch the news. With all of this going on, we just can't help but see that our country in particular is just in political turmoil in the last couple of years. And it's upsetting. And yet, for Christians, there's something even deeper going on than disputing what good people can disagree about over some political matters. There's something much more sinister happening. There, there is, if we have eyes to see, an open hostility to Christianity when marijuana shops can remain open, but churches have to close. There is an open rebellion against God's law when members of Congress in a House of Representatives committee meeting, like happened this month, are practically boasting about having an abortion instead of being ashamed of it. There's an open rejection of God's created order when under the guise of inclusivity guidelines, we're teaching kids in school that they can choose their own gender and whatever bathroom they want to go into and locker room they want to use and sports team they want to play on. This moral erosion is just happening so fast, it's hard to wrap your mind around it. And we're left shocked and dismayed. And we're, as time marches on and history is progressing, we keep hearing the constant refrain that we are on the wrong side of history. That Christianity is losing. Accept it, embrace it. You're just wrong. And we're all left wondering, what is happening? And where is our hope? What is going on in the world? And where do we look for help and for hope and encouragement? I think that's the exact question that Psalm 2 answers. I think Psalm 2 is going to help us understand what is happening in the world and where we look for help and hope. Psalm 2, as I just read, is 12 verses long, and it breaks up neatly into four stanzas of three verses each. We're going to look at each one of those stanzas. Look at the first three again. Verses one to three. Verses one to three describe the rebellion of the nations. Look at these verse verses again. It says, why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. What these verses are describing is that the nations are in a complete rebellion against God. There is an insurrection taking place against God and against his anointed. The nations, some translations say, are raging against God. And it's not an uncoordinated rebellion, no. There are, look at it says, it says they are devising. They're taking counsel together. They are plotting against God. And this is not some localized rebellion. It's not like just one nation or a couple nations. No. Look at the plurals. It says the nations, the peoples, the kings, the rulers. This is all the nations of the world, all of them, without exception, including our own, the United States of America. We might have been lulled to think otherwise, but this country, like every other nation, until Jesus returns... Is shaking its fist at God in defiance. And what are they rebelling against? Look at verse 3. Let us tear their fetters apart, they cry, and cast away their cords from us. 
the nations in their fits of rage are saying that God's moral law is like chains that they don't want anymore. They're, they're cords, they're fetters, they just want to rip off of them. Unbelievers hate God's moral law. They, they, they don't want to obey them. They're not neutral to God's law. They don't want to live under them. They don't want anyone to tell them how many genders there are. They don't want anyone to tell them who they can or cannot sleep with. They don't want anyone to tell them that they can't murder their own babies if they want to. They reject their creator and everything he commands of them. The nations are in rebellion against God and against his anointed and against everyone else who sides with them. And Christians, when we read these words, there's a message for us here. The early church quoted these exact words, but they weren't discouraged by them. They were encouraged by them. Because when they read them, I think the reason why so many Christians are just undone about all this is because we're somehow surprised or shocked that unbelievers are acting like unbelievers. We, we live in a world, we live in a country, we live around people all around us who hate God. And they are in open rebellion against God. And they want to cast off every vestige of his rule. They don't want God's people saying God's word to tell them what to do. This time between God's Christ's first coming and his second coming, we, we are sometimes confused. This is not a time of ease. This is not a time of safety. This is not a time of security. This time between Christ's first and second coming is a time of tribulation. It's a time of persecution. It's a time of the nations raging in an open rebellion against God. That is what is happening. That's what's going on around us. And it was told thousands of years ago, this is what would happen. So we should not be surprised. We should expect it to be difficult to be a Christian in a world like this. Not easy. Don't be surprised by that. And you won't be so undone when you see the world eroding around us and the nations raging. One more thing before we leave these opening verses. Will this rebellion work? What, what success will these nations have? Well, it's right there in verse 1. Look what he says. Why are the nations in an up, uproar and the people's devising a, look at that word, a vain thing? It's, it's vanity. It's utter foolishness. He, it, it, it is uh, not going to work. It might seem like they're winning right now, but not ultimately. The rebellion's going to fail. And the reason, the reason their rebellion is not going to work is because of who they're rebelling against. And that leads us to the next three verses. Verses four to six is the rebuke of the Lord. Just look how it starts. Look at this first line. Verse four, he who sits in the heavens. Now, he, he could have just said God. He, he could have said God, but, he, but no, no. He says, he who sits in the in the heavens. And the one sitting in the heavens is not sitting on a lawn chair or a beach chair. He's sitting on his throne. It's a way of describing God's rule. And it's way up in the heavens. What, what utter foolishness for these nations to shake their puny fist at God who sits enthroned in the heavens. They're rebelling against God and he, he has to, uh, in the Tower of Babel, and they're building this giant tower to get to the heavens to, to defy God. God has to, has to like squint to look down. Wait, wait, what's going on down there? It's so pathetic. He sits in the heavens. They, they're, they think they're big stuff because they have no idea who they're up against. I was trying to think of a way to describe this, and this is the illustration I could, I could think of. When me and my brothers were younger, we loved having water gun fights. And usually we just had those little squirt guns. But then, one summer, the super soakers came out. And you remember that for your kids? Super soakers? And we just had to have them. We, my brothers and I, we, we begged my parents, oh, please take us to the store. My, so they took us to Toys R Us, and my youngest brother, he got the super soaker 25. And my middle brother, he got the super soaker 50 because I was the oldest. I got the biggest gun they had. 
the Super Soaker 100. That's right. So, and then we went home, we filled those guns up, and you know what we started doing? <laughs> we just started patrolling the, the neighborhood. We, we were looking for a fight. <laughs> With our combined super soaking power of 175, we knew we could take on anybody. So we were, we were, looking, we were looking for someone to uh, put in their place. And we came walking around the corner, and these two boys, who I had never seen before, I lived in the same neighborhood my whole life growing up, and they were twins, and I looked across the street, and there, they had super soakers too. But they each had a super soaker 200. I didn't even know that even existed. <laughs> and they saw us, and we saw them, and we were holding our guns, looking at each other, like, oh, this is about to go down. <laughs> and I looked at my brothers, and we just ran away. We didn't even fight them. We, we knew we were outmatched. Now, the thing is, we, we thought we were big stuff because we didn't know who we were up against. But, the, but the, the chasm between these nations and their rebellion and the one who sits in the heavens is so great. It's not just uh, 175 super soakers against 400. It's like me and my brothers of our water guns going against a platoon of Navy SEALs and their M4 assault rifles. It, it's not even the same universe. It, it's, it's a joke. You laugh when I say it because it's what it is. It's utter foolishness. And that's why in verse 4, it says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. <laughs> he just laughs. And this is not a jovial laughing. He's mocking them. He is ridiculing them. And he's mocking their pathetic efforts to defy him. It's absolute foolishness and vanity. So his laughing in the next line turns to scoffing. God detests their rebellion. And he's not going to let it stand. In verse 5, God rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his fury. That's what it says. You know, in some Christian circles, some preachers don't talk about the wrath of God. It's not proper and polite company to talk about God being angry and wrathful. And so they just leave that part out. You know, a couple years ago, the PC... USA, a liberal Presbyterian denomination, they were making a new hymnal. And they wanted to include in their hymnal the song, In Christ Alone, a very popular modern hymn that we sing here. But they only wanted to include it if they could change one of the lines. They wanted to take out the line that talks about the wrath of God being satisfied on the cross. Now, thankfully, the hymn writers didn't go along with that change, and so it wasn't included. But these are hard truths when we talk about the wrath of God. And so Christians want to downplay them, or ignore them, or explain them away. And unfortunately, even sometimes in our circles, we can downplay God's wrath and not let it say what it actually says. You can't, you can't even start your Bible reading in the beginning and go more than a few chapters before you see God destroying the whole world. And then doing it again against all the nations. And you just read through the Bible, even in the book of Psalms, over and over again. Just, just an example, flip over to Psalm 5. Look at these verses in Psalm 5, verses 5 and 6. It says in verse 5, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. You destroy those who speak falsehood. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. Maybe you've heard the expression, I've heard it said, well, God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. Well, it's certainly true that God does hate sin, and it's also absolutely true that God does love the sinner. That's the message of the gospel. Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But Psalm 5.5 is also saying something else in addition to that. God does love the sinner, but God also hates the sinner. That's what it says. Think about it. God doesn't cast sin into hell. He casts sinners into hell as objects of his divine wrath and holy hatred. 
We, we can't let sentimentalism or folk religion trump what the Bible teaches about God. We have to let the Bible speak. We have to let God define who he is and how he behaves and what he thinks. And we believe that. We won't edit the words to the hymn in Christ alone. And we're not going to edit the words of the Bible and make it say something it doesn't say. This is what God's word says. You know, sometimes I wonder if we really believe in God's wrath. I mean, what really scares you? What, what keeps you up at night? Sometimes I think we're more terrified about a disease, we're more terrified about economic collapse or inflation than we are about the wrath of God. Sometimes we're more afraid of temporal, physical judgments more than cosmic, universal, eternal judgments. God's wrath is real. And it's coming against sinners. It's coming against everybody who's in rebellion against God. It's sure and it's certain. And we have to warn them. And how will God show his anger? What will he do about it? (laughs) This is where it gets interesting. Look at verse 6. He says, but as for me, this is what he's saying. He's saying, this is what I'm going to do about it. As for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. This is what God's going to do about the rebellion. He's going to send forth his champion. He's sending forth his king. He's installing, inaugurating in his throne his anointed son as an instrument of his judgment. He's setting his king on holy, on his holy hill, Mount Zion. And that leads us to the next set of verses. Verses 7 to 9 to describe this reign. When this king is installed on the mountain, what is he doing? Look at verse 7. It says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. Isn't that interesting how he describes that? He's talking about the decree of the Lord. You see, God God is not caught off guard by the nation's rebellion. He's not up in heaven uh, quivering and wondering what to do. He's not undone by it. He's not frustrated. His response is not some ad hoc response. Oh, well, man, I had plan A uh, to do this, but then the nations rebelled. I, I I guess I gotta try plan B or ooh, maybe plan C. No, it said this is God's decree. This is God's eternal decree. This is what God planned to happen. He's not surprised. He's not frustrated. He's not undone. That's not the God we worship. This is exactly what God planned would happen before creation. And his plan is in place. And then he says, as part of this decree, he said to me, this is God the Father speaking to God the Son, ultimately. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now, a lot of people have been confused by that language. This is actually a really important verse. It's quoted several times in the New Testament. And some people are like, well, I I thought Jesus was the eternal son to the eternal father. Well, he is. So then why does he say, well, today I have begotten you, as though it just happened at a point in history he became the son. Well, this is what we have to understand. The term son of God is used in multiple ways in the Bible. They're not all the same. So Jesus is the eternal son of the eternal father, but that's not what this verse is talking about. This verse is drawing on the language of 2 Samuel 7. Let me read this for you. In 2 Samuel 7, this is God's promise to David. This was God, when God makes his covenant to David, this is what he says, starting in verse 12. He says, when your days are complete and you lie down with your father, so long after David's dead, he says, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you. So he's going to come from the line of David. And I will establish his kingdom In verse 13, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish his throne of his kingdom forever. And then in verse 14, this is where we get the father-son language. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. What God is saying back there in 2 Samuel 7 is when he installs this descendant of David to be the king, to have his throne and his authority forever, that's when I will be a father to him and will be a son to me. That's when the eternal son becomes the king's son. And when does that happen? Well, thankfully, the Bible tells us. 
This very verse in Psalm 2-7 is quoted in Acts 13. Look at Acts 13. It tells us in Acts 13, verses 32 and 33, it says, this is Paul speaking in the synagogue, and he says, and we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. So the promise made to the fathers was what I just read in 2 Samuel 7. And then he says that God has fulfilled this promise to our children in that when he raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And he says it again, same idea Paul does in Romans chapter 1. Let me read that to hopefully make it clear. Romans 1 verse 3, concerning his son, so concerning the eternal son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh. Verse 4, who was declared the Son of God with power. When? How? By the resurrection from the dead. Jesus does not become the installed reigning king until his resurrection. Here's why this is important. Why did I go into all that detail to explain it? Besides the fact that the Bible makes a big deal about it. This helps us as Christians understand the difference between his first coming and his second coming. In his first coming, he comes as a gentle lamb. He comes as a sacrificial lamb. He comes to die on the cross and to pay for our sins. But when he comes the second time, he comes as the resurrected, reigning, victorious, and exalted king. That's why he comes differently, because when Jesus resurrected, he ascended in heaven, and he's just biding his time until he comes back at his appointed time to claim his inheritance, which is what the very next verse says. Look at verse 8. It says, ask of me, and I will surely give the nations, so these same nations that are rebelling, I'm going to give them to you as your inheritance. The very ends of the earth is your possession. Jesus owns them. They're his. The Father has given them to him. In the resurrection, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. And so, when he comes back, he's going to claim his inheritance. He's going to claim his birthright. He's going to take possession of what is his. And how is he going to do that? Look at the next verse. Verse 9. Verse 9, when Jesus comes back, it says, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. When Jesus comes back, it's not going to be a pretty sight. For those who are in rebellion against Jesus, it's, it says it's gonna, he's going to uh, break them with a rod of iron. He, he, he's going to take his scepter like a baseball bat and crack them like clay pots. And it's not just breaking up their rebellion. That's not what it says. Verse 9 says, you shall break them with a rod of iron. You will shatter them like earthenware. When Jesus comes back, he's going to conquer every rebellious nation, king, peoples, and person. Amen. He's going to claim to be, he's going to prove to be what he claimed to be, the victorious reigning king. This verse is quoted in Revelation 19. It's the Revelation 19, Pastor Heath is preaching that passage tonight and next week, so I don't want to steal his thunder, but the same idea is also taught in 2 Thessalonians 1. Let me read this for you. These are not the verses we usually think of when we think of Jesus. This is what the Bible teaches. 2 Thessalonians 1, starting in verse 5, is what it reads. This is a plain indication of God's righteous judgment so that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which indeed you are suffering. For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Verse 7, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. And what's he going to do? When Jesus comes back in the heavens with his angels, what's he going to do? Verse 8, dealing out retribution. Some translations say vengeance to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And when is this going to happen? Verse 10, 
when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed. Jesus is the reigning king, the resurrected king, and when he comes back, he's going to break up every rebellion by destroying every rebel. Now, you might be asking, well, isn't God love? Will God really bring this vengeance on all these people? What hope is there for rebellious sinners? Well, this is like the last three verses of the psalm. Verses 10, 11, and 12 are the refuge in the sun. Now God speaks to the very same people. Now, therefore, he says, O kings, O kings, and O judges, the same people that are in rebellion in the first couple of verses, O kings, O judges, O peoples in rebellion, show discernment, take warning, be, be wise and be warned. He, he's offering grace and mercy to the same rebels who rebelled against him. This is good news. This is good news for all of us because all of us are included in these who rebel against God. None of us were born loving God. All of us were born sons of disobedience. By nature, children of wrath, Ephesians 2 says. None of us were born in God's grace. We had to accept it and receive it because Jesus offers it to us. You see, all of us are rebel sinners. Jesus only dies for the ungodly. Jesus only dies for sinners. Jesus only dies for the rebellious. Because the righteous don't need them. But everyone else does. And it's good news because you and I are among the latter group. We are the rebellious. We are the sinners that need his grace. And he offers this grace. He offers this love. He offers it to whosoever will turn to him. And he says to them, you need to worship the Lord with reverence. Rejoice with trembling. The, the, the reason he can offer this salvation, the reason he can offer this escape is because, it's not because he forgot about his wrath. It's not because he, he, he ignored it. It's not because he sidestepped it or just said, yeah, I just changed my mind. No, it's because Jesus Christ, as a substitutionary death for us on the cross, absorbed the wrath of God. He took it all upon himself. On himself. He drank it to the last drop, and there's nothing left for those who are in Christ. And that's why there's salvation to be offered. And that's why we can rejoice with trembling. What an odd phrase. Isn't that odd? Rejoice with trembling. I was trying to think about how to explain what this means. This is, the, this is what I came up with. I probably thought about this because my oldest son is 16 now, so he's starting to drive. <laughs> some of you are. <laughs> some of you have been down that road with your kids. This is my first. You know, when I first got my license, I... It was only driving for a few months, and one day I was driving, and uh, I was driving a little too fast. I admit that. It was raining. The roads were slick, and I was uh, following someone, and I took a sharp turn, and uh, the car just spun out of control. I don't know how bad it was. It felt like several rotations. I just spun out of control, and I ended up in a ditch. Now, thankfully, there was no cars behind me, Thankfully, there was no structures next to me. I was fine. The car was fine-ish, other, <laughs> other than a few busted tires and some bent axles. That, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was my dad's car. <laughs> uh, but when I had to go tell my dad, I was rejoicing with trembling. I was rejoicing because I was okay but I was trembling because I knew how much worse it could have been. It could have been a lot, lot worse. And that's how it is for us in the Christian life. We are rejoicing in the salvation God's given us, but we rejoice of trembling because we know God's wrath is real. We know God's wrath is coming, and we know we deserved it, and we were this close to getting it. Apart from the gracious mercy of Jesus Christ, none of us deserve God's mercy. We, we, we are not Christians. We're not saved. We're not recipients of his grace and mercy because we're better. We're not saved because we're smarter. We didn't figure out some secret all on our own. No, we would never choose God on our own. He, he had to shower us, lavish us with his grace and his mercy and draw us to himself. And he saves us. 
And now we can rejoice with trembling because that could have been us. But Jesus saved us. And he offers that forgiveness. He offers that salvation to anybody who would repent of their sins and trust in Christ. They too can be saved. What do they have to do to receive it? Look at verse 12, the last verse. It says, kiss the son that he not become angry and you perish in the way. Because his wrath is soon be kindled. We don't know when he's coming back. But if you want to avoid it, you have to kiss the son. This, this kissing of the son is not a, uh, a friendly kiss. Uh, here, the, the picture here is of a conquered king coming into the throne room of the king who conquered him. And in front of the whole court, he walks up and he kisses the feet of this conquering king. And in doing so, he's pledging his allegiance. He's giving up his rebellion. And he's saying, I follow you. This is not a kiss of friendliness. This is a kiss of submission. This is a kiss of repentance. And that's what you have to do. If there's anyone listening here this morning that, that is still under the wrath of God, that has not yet turned to Christ, dear unbeliever, we're preaching this message for you. You need to turn from your sin. You need to trust in Christ. You need to surrender your life. You need to kiss the Son. You need to receive the salvation that he's offered because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. His wrath may soon be kindled and it will fall upon you if you don't turn from your sin and trust in Christ. But you can be saved. You can receive his forgiveness. This is a weighty psalm. This is a heavy message. But it doesn't end in doom and gloom. Look at the very last line. This is where the hope and the help are. It says, how blessed are all who take refuge in him. I love that. There's hope and there's blessing for everyone who finds their refuge in him. My family, we moved here a few years ago in the middle of June. When we were moving in, people were saying, hey, uh, you know, hurricane season's coming soon. I was like, oh, uh, we didn't have that where I moved from. Uh, what's hurricane season? <laughs> He's like, well, what do I do for that? I'm like, well, you've got to have your hurricane escape plan. I'm like, uh, what's that? Well, if you don't have a place to go to find refuge, what you're going to end up doing is just when the sirens come and the news is announcing you got to evacuate, you just jump in your car of your family and what you got, and you just start driving north or west and hope you can find some place to stay, and you don't get gouged on pricing at some hotel or try to ask them to bunk in. Well, that doesn't sound like a very good plan. No, it's not. That's why you got a hurricane escape plan. I'm like, oh. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, there's a hurricane. God's wrath coming. We have a hurricane escape plan. We have the refuge of the sun. For those who don't have your hurricane escape plan of God's wrath, this is your chance to do it. You can find refuge in the sun. He will absorb God's wrath for you and drink it all the way down so there's none left for you. Only goodness and blessing and hope and help and salvation for any who turn to Jesus. You just need to kiss the Son, and He'll welcome you in His refuge. This world is in rebellion against God. These verses don't lie, they don't paint a pretty picture. But here's the hope we are not on the wrong side of history, because we know where this is heading. We've read God's decree. And we have an escape plan. God's not surprised by any of this. So we shouldn't be either. Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, he's going to make everything right. Because when he comes back, he's coming back as the resurrected and returning king, son of God. So, so don't despair. Don't despair that this world seems like it's spinning out of control. Don't look in the wrong spot for help and hope. The next election cycle is not going to fix these problems. They're way more systemic than that. But when King Jesus returns, he will prove that we are on the right side of history because we have kissed the feet of the Son. Praise God for that. Amen. Let's pray.
Oh God, we are so thankful for the clarity of your word to prepare us to live in this world, to not be shocked by the raging of the nations around us, and to point us to the right spot for help and hope. We praise you, Father, for King Jesus and what he has done for us on the cross and the resurrection, and we eagerly await that return. Oh, come, Lord, quickly, please, we pray. And I pray, God, for any who have not found refuge in the Son, that you would save them, you would draw them to yourself, you would open their eyes to see that they can find blessing and hope and help and refuge. But trusting in Jesus' death on the cross, and resurrection life for them, we thank you, Father, for this message. We thank you, Father, for the hope and encouragement we can have in the midst of these trying times. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.